Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to Life Inner Show. I'm your host, Jason Wojo. I am joined by my Polish co-host, Polish Peter. And on the Life Inner Show, we help people make more, work less, and live better. What's up, bro? Well, I'm excited about this particular episode because we're talking about negotiation. Guess who needs it? You. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do need Yeah. Well, listen, we're going to talk with Rick Fagan. Rick's a super interesting guy who's worked. Uh, I've known him for, gosh, uh, almost you know half a decade at this point. And uh, he's done things with a, being a tour manager to huge name bands, to representing professional athletes, to working with NASCAR, to uh, brokering jets, like all kinds of really, really cool things that you would, you know, are, are not super typical. Right. And so he's learned a few things he's going to share with us about how negotiating and talking to people. Yeah. One of the cool things that I liked um, the Eminem story was awesome. So listen to that because I think you can use that in anything that you do in your business. Yeah. Because that's an important detail, that story. And then towards the end of the podcast, we asked him like one thing that you took out of through all the years of negotiation that uh, you gave a really good nuggets. So I would encourage you guys Let's to listen it. to it and, and see what you get out of this. Yeah. It's going to be good stuff. Let's jump in right now. Here's Rick Fagan. Rick Fagan. What's up, brother? Welcome to the show, man. How are you? Good, brother. How about you, man? Good. Yeah, doing well. So uh, for our audience, man, like I got to tell you, uh, when did when did we first meet Rick? This was five years ago, maybe? Um, like 2017. 17. Okay. So four years ago. Um, and I remember, so we met, we met first at a get a life getaway. And I remember we went to dinner, I think at like an Applebee's. That was in 16. Yeah. It was like November, December of 16. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're back there, man. And we went to this Applebee's and we just started chatting and you just totally like, man, I was just like really intrigued and fascinated and uh just instantly like man like i this is a guy you need to get to know more just really cool guy and we stayed in touch over the years and um you have an awesome very unique and rare history of of employment of of gigs of entrepreneurial kind of things and um and now you're actually you know as we we just spoke recently and I want to let our listeners know what the main topic is. You know, we're going to talk about some of the things, your, some of your skills you've developed over all these uh, incredible industries and experiences in, in terms of negotiations. But for our listeners who don't know anything about you, like give us a little bit of a, like walk us through like uh, how you got to where you are today. So I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I was going to college in Cleveland to become a CPA. I always was really great at math. And uh, during my college years, a friend of mine offered me, who was in the music business, offered me a summer job as his assistant on the road. So I said, yeah, I'll do it. You know, how much does it pay? And it was paying more than my family combined, all of them, (laughs) more than they were making a month. So I thought, well, hey, I'll do that, you know, and pay for college. And then one tour led to the next, to the next, to the next. And I ended up uh, leaving a 32-year career in 2016 from the music business. So I had a had a lot of uh, interesting um, experiences throughout the years, and has kind of led me down this path to where I am today. And what what did you do in the music business? Were you were you a tour manager, or what? What did you do? Like, yeah, I was a tour manager, so I was in charge of putting together the tours starting with assisting the agencies with the routing to hiring all the crew, buses, sound, lights, building budgets, um, you know, hiring the private jets or whatever, depending on the level of the band. So dude, any, any bands that our listeners may recognize? Uh, probably all of them, depending on what kind of music you're into. <laughs> Did you, man. So yeah. Like, so any, any, say- are you allowed to throw any of this stuff out here? Is it top secret? Yeah, I mean, I worked for, uh, Soundgarden, Audio Slave, Guns N' Roses, Stone Temple Pilots, Limp Bizkit, Corn, uh, a lot of bands that had varying degrees of difficulty, but they paid more. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you get you get paid for that more. I didn't mind. Is that you get paid for the for the amount of stress you endure? <laughs> right, it's the right, brown right. M and M's only. So right? I am not getting paid yeah. enough, Peter, to put up with you. Now that I'm thinking about it, Rick, you're you're really opening my eyes to this. <laughs> Well, in that case, I still am looking for those brown M and M's in my bowl. Wait, wait, the wait table. one more. What did you just say right now? Like uh, brown M and M's. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I'll give you some brown M and M's. 
<laughs> okay, this is going off the rail here. Okay, now. so Let's all right, so here we are. Here. <laughs> so so Rick, we it's uh, that Van Halen story, and you know the reason why the whole Eminem picking colors of Eminems. It was I think it was with Van Halen. It was no green Eminems, and the reason was at that time in rock and roll promoters were just booking shows they'd be like don't worry the power will be correct and you know the stage is going to be great and everything and then they'd show up and literally a uh, journey tells a story where they got to this gig and literally had to duct tape tables together to make a stage because there was oh. no stage what yeah yeah it was crazy so <laughs> And, you know, they get there and there's not enough power. So they're literally running power from three different businesses within the in the area, you know, power cables across the street over over top <laughs> poles just to get power to do the show. So, you know, one thing about rock and roll is it teaches you to just get things done. You don't have the option to say no on anything ever. It's we need this done and we've got about four hours till showtime on a Sunday. I remember being in Canada with Rob Zombie and we uh we always pull permits for pyro because his show is heavily based on pyro and the venue the week before uh, had decided no more pyro in the venue. So literally the entire show is based off of fire. <laughs> so we had to get the, uh, the mayor involved. I think we were in Winnipeg, I want to say, but we had to get the mayor involved on a Sunday at five in the afternoon and all these people and different fire um uh, chiefs and everybody must have had 60 people in this meeting a half an hour before the show right because rob says hey if we don't get pyro i'm not doing my show so it was sold out arena trying to figure it out so the one thing that it does is it breeds you to really be diligent about getting things done and and you know being able to obviously never accept the word no uh, which works good in business, not so much in your personal life. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, but anyway, getting back to the Eminem story real quick. So the promoters weren't reading the, the riders correctly. So what would happen is the band would get there and they'd say, yeah, yeah. And they'd sign it off and it's like, ah, we'll make it work. And it kind of was that. So what they started to do was to see if they read it, they would put little things like, you know, here's our dressing room requirements. We want this, 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 a bowl of M&Ms minus the green ones. This is very important. Please do not miss this step. They never read that. So all of a mm. sudden there'd be a bowl of M&Ms. They knew that if they didn't read that little detail in the food section, that they should start to worry about things like power and staging and all these other important things that, you know, could be life or death in a situation, you know, where electricity and things like that are involved. So Good. Well, Dude, all right. This gives hack. me some good ideas for our Gear Life Getaway events, man. Pyro taping tables together for your stage, Virgil. I mean, I, think I dude, we're gonna we what based on what we just learned, we can level up this event like tremendously. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> So we already well, have fire going, just need to do it more often throughout the event, right? Right. Yeah. Flamethrowers. Yeah. I mean, we're, it's all coming in now. Lasers. <laughs> Easy. Lasers. Yes. Well, so, all right. So you, you did the band thing for a long time. You also have represented professional athletes. You've uh, to, to now you're, uh, we just talked, you're negotiating like jet sales. You're brokering jets. It sounds like, um, did I miss anything there? Is that, is that the, the majority of your, of your focus? Yeah. I mean, in between, I did a lot of uh, event production stuff too. I mean, I produced the pro football hall of fame weekend for a couple of years in a row. So I was flying in and off of tour to go and have those meetings and those sorts of things and negotiating a lot of sponsorship deals. That was something that I'd love doing. I love contracts and reading contracts and negotiating terms and things like that. So that led me into working with some athletes, mostly in CrossFit, but I have worked with some professional tennis players, um, things of that nature. So it's kind of opened up into a variety of things. And yes, now in private jets, you know, somebody's looking to buy one, they'll hire us and we'll go in and negotiate the deal and get you a shiny new plane for <laughs> whatever amount of money you're willing to spend. What Rick, what can I get for like a thousand bucks? Uh, we could probably go to Amazon for that. <laughs> okay. Maybe yeah, a toy, well, like an RC, like, oh, like yeah. yeah, right. Man, right no, so the river. For a thousand right, bucks, right. you might even get to put a little jet fuel in it. Be one of those <laughs> yeah. Like an ounce. Yeah. Well, so, all right. So tell me, man, like, so this is, so this is kind of leading us into our discussion, like, which is you've essentially through trial and error, it sounds like, like you didn't have any formal training negotiations, right? You just picked this up. Like, are you just a natural, like, how does, how did you be, uh, 
is, is this just something that you developed through experience? You know, growing up, there weren't really a lot of books on negotiation or there weren't a lot of classes, even at colleges on negotiation. You know, now you can pretty much go to every university and there's negotiation classes on you pick the subject. They'll make it even as specific as picking a subject. But back in the day, there wasn't much. So, you know, finding out as much as I could from what literature was out there and then learning from people that were just amazing negotiators, you know, in the music business, there's a lot of managers who are really intelligent and smart and figuring out things, um, you know, in contracts and record deals that didn't exist. You know, I worked for a, a manager um, and he managed a lot of huge bands. He ended up, you know, buying Ticketmaster. I mean, he was really smart and was always looking for bigger deals. And this guy, he invented some of the processes and he invented a lot of the uh, tactics in entertainment, you know, that are widely used today and are become standard in a lot of contracts and things. So, uh, you know, I learned from a lot of guys like that and I was always curious. So I was the kid sitting in the corner of the room, just listening and paying attention to the boring stuff that nobody else wanted to, to listen to or pay attention to. And so, and so you've, and this is a skill that you've obviously used to your benefit in every field. It seems like what you're, what you're talking about, there's a significant part of negotiations that's, that's involved in you being successful. Yeah. You know, one thing I have learned is, you know, you have to be truthful and you have to have your hands on the table, completely transparent. I've been in negotiations where everybody's trying to have something that they want to keep as there, you know, you, you hear these terms gambit and all these little things to try to maneuver negotiations, but you know, look, in this day and age, especially with the internet, there's not much you can't learn and there isn't much that you can hide in a negotiation. Somebody's going to find out something about what's going on. So it's best to you know present it up front. And then knowing what the other side wants is extremely important. You know, some may say, well, how do I find that out? You know, just having conversations and listening, listening is the key. You know, I will get guys to talk. I know some leading questions and then I can sit back and listen and take notes. And in them talking even about their personal lives, you can pick up a few things that will let you know about how they're going to negotiate this deal or where their ego's at. And, you know, reading a book that I read, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, great book on understanding human behavior. And if you can put your ego in check and give praise and understanding to people that dramatically crave that, you know, which is a lot of people that do well in any industry they're in, in negotiating. Um, you'll go a lot farther in increasing your bottom line because people want to be around people that like them. Some look up to them, but mostly people that like them. Hey, look, I really appreciate your view on that. That was amazing. Those sort of things. Just a little small gesture like that will really change the outcome of the negotiation. A lot of my negotiations have unfortunately or fortunately, however you look at it, been over the phone. It's not always easy for me to get on a plane and run somewhere, especially in the last few years, or just logistics wise of where my client is or where the plane is they wanna buy or where the athlete was. So a lot of things have to take place over the phone. They say the worst thing you could do is negotiate over the phone. I found that by listening more, uh, even more so than in person, you start to really feel that energy from that person and that vibe. And you can kind of figure out which direction, you know, they want to take things and whether where they're you know drawing a line or where somebody else is drawing a line for them um, behind the scenes. You know, they may not be the final decision maker and they're negotiating on behalf of, you know, the A party, if you will. And then, you know, they're kind of the B party. So you try to negotiate at the top, but at the end of the day, it's not always possible. So you got to understand, uh, you know, where in line you're, you're sitting with the person that you're talking to. So at the beginning, so I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, you mentioned like kind of having your hands on the table and being upfront. Do you think, is, is there a benefit to you hiding what you really want with the hopes, with, with the hopes that like, Hey, like I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, um, if they know what I really want, they're going to use that against me. Or you just know like, Hey, this is the most important thing to me. And you're right up front with that. Like, I guess there's so many different models that like, you know, uh, of, of like, you know, getting to yes, is a book that's out there and, 
And I think, you know, you've, you've, uh, you've, I think done some work with like Oren Claff, I believe. Yep. Um, and like, so I, what are, is that something that you say, like, you know, just be upfront with what you're really after or, or is it a dance a little bit sometimes? It's a dance. I mean, you know, I studied a lot with Chris Voss too. I read his books, took his online courses. He's amazing. He's an ex FBI hostage negotiator and super intelligent about the negotiating him. I mean, he's negotiating for lives in, in hostage situations where, you know, we're negotiating for money, which can be your life in some situations, your business life. Um, but he's one of the mind of you give the ugly up front. you know, here it is. Your son or daughter is going to end up dead if we don't do this. And what it does is it scares people enough that they want to listen, right? I haven't run into a lot of situations where I've required that kind of, you know, or those situations where you're negotiating for someone's life. Although, you know, I will say in a negotiation sometime, and it does depend on the situation, you may come in and you may say, okay, here's the bottom line. You know, where we want to go from here is fine, but this is all I can afford, or this is all we're going to, this is the bottom line of what we're going to accept. And then it kind of puts them on the, hey, wait a minute, I'm, I'm going to try to get it cheaper. And then you have your information to back it up or why they don't want to pay you. They are telling you their story. But once they know where the, the line is, it's easier for them to understand what their line is because, you know, our lines are going to be completely different. You know, I may want this jet at an inexpensive price because my client's given me a number and your guy obviously wants a price, but he more so says, I want to get rid of this plane because I'm getting a new one and we need that money for the down payment on the new one or whatever. So do you have to make sure that, you know, you understand where their position is? You know, that's why a lot of times when I come in, I'll say, look, just give me your bottom line right now. Let's talk about it. And then we can work left or right from there. I may be able to concede and give a little more cash up front because my guy's given me, you know, a 10% variance that you don't know about. I don't have to disclose that generally, but I know that. And I'm not trying to hide anything like, hey, you know, we want to get the plane in our name and steal it. You know, that's not going to obviously happen. Nobody's going to do anything without escrow and all this other stuff. But when at least you understand and you know you have, and I'm sure there's things they know that, you know, they don't want to give up like, hey, look, you know, we could practically give this plane away. We just need it out of our name. I did a negotiation course once. I don't know if you remember in the back of the airline magazines, it was Chester Karras, the Karras organization, you know, and they were like, you can negotiate, you know, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate was his big uh, quote, claim to fame. And I went to one of these negotiations and they hand, there's six of us at a table, three and three on either side, and they hand each of us a piece of paper. Mine tells me things about you and yours you get tells you things about me. And it was an interesting kind of back and forth because you don't know what they know about you and they don't know what you know about them. So you're negotiating on what you're told you need to get though. So like, you know, Jason, you have to walk out of there with 90% of his $1,000 that he has. And then he's like, well, you know, you have to sell this widget because if you don't sell this one, even if you got to sell for 10%, we're out of business. So you don't know the two sides. And I did really well in it. And the guy said, you know, have you taken our course before? I said, no, I never, I never took it. This is the first time. And he said, you know, well, what was it? I said, well, everybody's got a story on both sides. We, there's things we're not going to tell one another. Although at the end of the day, I know there's some desperation in getting the deal done on your side. And you know, there's some desperation on my side right? Or we wouldn't be sitting at the table. We need to sell this widget to feed our families, or we need to get this funding to build the business to another level. So there's a lot of little things that you can kind of guess. I don't like to use the word assume, but you can guess that there's going to be these little tidbits of things. So you have to kind of look at negotiation from a side of not just straight on, but kind of a roundabout of different angles to look at because from every angle you look at it, it's going to look different for them and for you. What are some of the questions you typically ask to help get a frame on what the the situation you're dealing with is and what, what maybe the intentions are in the position of this person? Like where do you have any, your favorite questions to start to like ask and 
get the conversation started to try to explore? Cause it sounds like what, what I'm hearing is like, you're really doing some like reconnaissance early on some relationship building, um, trying to establish some level of, of trust, but how do you, like, it just seems like such a, this is such a hard topic to me. It seems to, to really dive into and teach. Is that something you've experienced yourself too? And like, how do you, how do you address like this process? I think it's difficult because and, and, and in a way of looking from a teaching perspective, people want, give me a, give me B that's it. Right. What do I have to do to get this done? And if I said the magic word is, you know, give me the money, right. Or the phrase, then they give you the money. You're going, okay, cool. I'm done. That's great. I love it. There is no one size fits all with the subject of negotiating, you know, mm. whether, because obviously if you're, if you're negotiating for someone's life in a hostage situation, there's not going to be, you know, well, let me get back to you. You know, let me go talk to my people. It's like, you don't want to get them off the phone. The, the person who's taken this person, because you want to try to keep them engaged, figure out, ask questions, get them to break it down. Where when you're in a sponsorship deal, you know, you say, Hey, what's your, you know, what's your, your, uh, your plan for my athlete? You know, what do you want? To utilize them for oh we want you know they got a million posts and we want our subscribers and we want to post so we can get those million people to possibly buy from us okay but what else i mean what do you see long term because when i was working with athletes the one thing i would ask them is what's your five ten year plan with us going into this negotiation with this company are you looking for the money and if you are that's fine but we need just need to know where we stand in it or are you looking for a long-term relationship that when you retire from being an athlete you'll still be able to do commercials or support them or they support your charity or whichever way it goes. And none of the people that I had worked with had ever thought of or asked, had been asked that question before. And they were, wow, I never thought of that, you know, and then it takes on a whole new life. And I think also whether you are negotiating, you know, terms of even a venue where you're going to do your next event, you know, looking at the long-term effects. Is this a city that we see ourselves coming back to five years or over the course of five years, maybe three times? Sure. Well, then let's see what we can work in to build the bond between their people and us within the organization so that they're happy to have us back and they want us back. It, giving just as much as taking, I think is important too. Um, but as far as leading questions, I, again, it depends on I keep saying it depends because it does depend on what you're actually looking for in your outcome. Um, so, uh, sorry, go ahead, Peter. You but so to... listen, so I got a question because it sounds to me like as you are having the conversations with these people, as you're negotiating in the back of your mind, you're trying to achieve some kind of a goals or, or waypoints or some kind of a metrics for yourself. So you know how to negotiate like, are you thinking like, okay, this is what I want to get out of this conversation. I want to know maybe their story. I want to know what's like really the big problem. I mean, is that what you're kind of thinking in the back of your head? Like what are some of the objectives in that conversation? Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we get a call on a jet, let's say um, somebody, Hey, you know what? I want to buy a jet. We will immediately do our research on them. Who are they? I mean, is this somebody just kicking the tires that, you know, has a hundred thousand in the bank, but they someday want to buy a jet. So, you know, they've read the books where it says, go out and sit in that Lamborghini and, you know, pretend you own it and all that kind of stuff. You know, that in the jet world, those calls and or meetings can take up a lot of valuable time. So, you know, we need to do the research on the person. And again, with today's technology and the advancement in, 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 in information availability, we're able to, you know, find out somewhat about, you know, did they have a criminal record of, you know, stealing things. I remember we were on tour. I was on tour. Uh, what year would that have been? 2002. And I was with a band that was very popular coming up the ranks. They're so they had two songs on the radio at the same time is blown up. And I get a call and they said, you know, are you the tour manager for uh, this band? I said, yeah. And they said, well, we've been waiting here for you for three hours. Said, what do you mean? Who, who, are you, who are you waiting for? Oh, well, we're waiting for, you know, the band to show up. We've got the jet. We've got all the food you ordered. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, we, uh, you know, we're, we're here waiting for you. You ordered this private jet. I said, we are in California. The jet was in like North Carolina. I said, uh, we won't be coming to get on any jet. Here, there was a kid out there that was 
an imposter of me. He was saying he was Rick Fagan, the tour manager for the band. And he said, look, we're, they're coming. I need you to book this jet. These guys did no research. They didn't look to see who really the tour manager was. Look at the tour schedule to see where it could have possibly been because internet was pretty prevalent in 2002. It, it did nothing. So they fueled up a jet, hired a crew, put catering on the plane based on some guy's phone call without ever. And so there was a lot of money wasted because they have to pay mm -hmm. those pilots. The plane sitting there idling costs money per hour to the owner and the operator. So that was it was interesting to me and that that always sticks in my head. So whenever somebody calls for a plane or, hey, can you negotiate this, this sponsorship contract? Yep. You know what? Let me get right back to you um, and uh, we'll set up a proper call. And then I do a little research to find out, you know, and I have had people in the entertainment world who, you know, they were not who they said they were. So, you know, doing your due diligence up front, I think is important in anything, in any negotiation, in any, I mean, look, you know, it's even like with dating, you know, you, personal life, you, you hopefully want to meet someone through another friend. So you get that kind of background, like, what are they like? Who is this? How are they, mm -hmm. you know, so and so. And then, you know, that's the bad thing about online dating. You only read what they put in there. Yeah, dude, it's an, it's an ad. And it's, yeah, it's exactly <laughs> what it is. And it's hardly ever what it appears. <laughs> that's right. Well, so, I mean, as you said, somebody called from North Carolina, first thing popped into mind, was it Bojo that was probably <laughs> lives over there? So he said he talked in a Polish accent. So I, you know, uh, yeah. he was talking in Polish accent. All right. So, okay. <laughs> so listen, sounds to me like the uh, pre-negotiation, the due diligence, a huge part of the overall negotiation. Yes. Right. Sounds to me like a lot of people actually miss that part. Like how important do you think that research is prior to it in regards to the whole thing? I mean, you don't want to get into paralysis by analysis, you know, where you're overanalyzing every little detail. Well, you know, they did this or they did this. And I mean, I've done business with guys that have had, you know, criminal records from college drunk days and things like that. And it, it doesn't matter. I mean, look, everybody makes mistakes. It just depends on the level of that mistake. Now, obviously, if it's fraudulent financial issues, well, then, you know, we're going to have a little bit more of an issue with that. And listen, there's probably plenty of people out there that don't care about that risk. So they'll find somebody to do that. It's not something I want to go down. I mean, I've sat in lawsuits and depositions based on these sort of things with sponsors, um, sponsorships on tours. You know, we used to get a couple, uh, uh, couple sponsors for each tour in the later years because it became the bigger thing, starting off with the Rolling Stones um, Verizon deal years ago. You know, that was one of the big uh, sponsorship deals that really kind of got people thinking, hey, wait a minute, you know, we could really make a lot of money, you know, selling the rights to somebody owning the name of this tour, per se. So that became a big thing in, in music and entertainment. We see it now, vodka companies and, you know, all this other kind of stuff, supporting tours and, you know, the Jägermeister, uh, you know, rock hard tour and it's got six bands on it those type of things so sponsorship negotiation maybe with one band turned into a string of shows so you know you never know where it can go but it's always good to know where you are kind of heading and yes due diligence first and you're right peter a lot of people do not do it it's it's amazing to me when you say oh yeah they're like yeah yeah i looked them up you know i had a guy i was doing a lot of sponsorship stuff in nascar and I had a guy call me up and he said, yeah, you know, I got this guy and I vetted him and I said, okay. So I get on the phone call with this guy and this guy was that turned me on to this person was pretty reputable. So I thought, okay, he knows, you know, he knows this guy. He's obviously vetted him. This guy was a tire kicker. He just wanted to get into motorsports, knew nothing, knew no one in NASCAR, didn't have a car to sponsor. And I thought, where did this all come from? Oh, he said, well, you know, I did tell him that, but I was just trying to get the call to see if I could raise the money, then I'll buy the car. <laughs> I said, well, if you would have started with the truth, right? And you would have started with that conversation, then we might have found you a car, got you some funding, and we could have put the project together for you. Because that's not out of the question. It's mm -hmm. just, you were 180 degrees in the other direction of what you're telling people that your real goal was. So you lied. And now you're trying to, you know, patch it up. And now I don't want anything to do with it because it's just, you know, I've got a, I've got a reputation and I don't want to ruin that because who else knows what you've said that could be a lie and what you've told other people. Yeah. And then we found out that not only this guy, but 
the other guy that I knew, they were kind of telling stories to one another. And it just, it was unfortunate because um, uh, it cost them both an opportunity in a industry that they both loved and they were fans of, but they didn't go about it the right way and get themselves into a position to, to be in the industry or make a difference. So Rick, I, um, a few things I'm hearing, I want to just, just re- echo this back to you. Tell me if this is, if, if, if I'm inaccurate with any of this stuff, cause I, there's, you've, you've covered it. We've covered a lot of stuff and I want to make sure our listeners are getting this as well as continue. But number one, I'm hearing like, before you even sit down with this person, number one, do your due diligence on this party, whether it's, you know, you finding everything you can out about them, finding out, are they legit? Do they have a history? What are they what do they like? Maybe, maybe you can even go to their social media and find out like, Hey, like they seem to have a proclivity for exotic sports cars. And somehow all this information becomes valuable for you. Number two I'm hearing is like, know for sure what you want out of that negotiation, not just in the moment, but in the long term. like, is there a long term here? And if so, let's make sure that weighs into how we handle this conversation and, and the ongoing relationships. Number three, I'm hearing is, um, be upfront, be honest, like on your position, not, not to give you a disadvantage, but certainly don't misrepresent. And it doesn't mean you have to disclose everything. Like you said, like a variance, for instance, but be kind of upfront and, and straightforward to someone and, and kind of be I, what I, you didn't say this, but I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost hearing like, Hey, you know, negotiate the way you want to be negotiated with. Um, that might be something that is, uh, that maybe, maybe, maybe is something that, that people could, could take with that. And then I'm hearing like really, um, you know, um, a, uh, well, that, that, that's probably the biggest, but I want to pause there for a second. Does that all sound accurate up to that point? It and does. I hear a lot of listening too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of listening. Yeah. Listen, it's important. You know, I, it is important to do your research, but again, you don't want to paralyze yourself and trying to overanalyze everything. You want to get a good idea in, on, in your own, in your gut of what you feel about the people you're negotiating with. You know, I was working a jet deal in 2000 or sorry, 2019. And it was right before the pandemic all closed everything down. It was third or fourth quarter. And it was for a lot of planes. There was a company that was merging with another company. So they had to get rid of their jet fleet and so on and so forth. And, you know, this deal came through somebody else. This guy gave me a ton of information. I mean, emailed me stacks of information. And I still did my due diligence, found out that his story was completely incorrect. And I got the right story because I ended up calling somebody at the parent company who was buying this other company and said, okay, this is what I heard. And the guy said, well, that's none of that's true. Mm. This is the truth. This is what we're doing with the jets. This is so it made things clear, but we could have went down a rabbit hole of setting up buyers and all this other sort of stuff and took ourselves, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in debt flying to go look at these planes that we weren't even allowed to look at anyway. So the deal never happened because we didn't have access to the deal. They had a a seller already in place, but the guy that brought it to me was 1 million percent confident. He had this deal. It was his deal. He had paperwork to support it. And you know, the paperwork is from a mechanic that worked on the plane that said, yeah, we'll do this, but it was all presented nicely. And I get it. He wanted to get, uh, get a seat at the table and, have a big boy negotiation on a, you know, hundred million dollars worth of planes. But the problem is it would have sunk everybody in the deal. I mean, we would not have been able to uh, mm. move forward if, if that would have been the case. So yes, that's true. Um, uh, so yeah, doing the due diligence is very important. What was your second question? Peter? So I got a question for you. Um, what's the one thing that you've learned over the years that had a, big help for you as far as negotiation, like they have made an impact for you to be able to negotiate well. I mean, you read enough books, you start to see a pattern of certain things that they all talk about, you know, and, and, and if you look at a lot of the books that have been written in the past six, seven years, you know, it is more about that transparency section because, you know, again, with all the technology and all the information out there now, you know, I could come to you and say, Peter, you know, I manage, you know, $700 million in planes sitting in my inventory right now and all these sort of things. All you have to do is punch in a few keys and you can find that information out right now. So mm-hmm. when you find out that I don't have that now, eh, you know, now how do we want to do business with this guy? 
You know, you'd be better off saying, hey, look, I am not in this space. I'd love to sell a jet. You know, how do I get into it? And I want to learn. And I do know a guy who wants to sell his plane. And what if I could bring you that? Will you teach me? You know, there's ways, I think, to go about that versus, you know, some people think they're going to take a course online and now they're a great negotiator and they throw out a few keywords. And, you know, there's these guys that have created these banta sheets which is best alternative to a deal, right? So, or I forget exactly what it means, the acronym, but it's something of that nature, right? So you have a plan B. Well, if you know what your end goal is ultimately, which I believe was one of your questions, if you know what your end goal is and what you want on this level, then it's easy to know where on the scale you're going to be, you know what, that's good for us. We're happy there or have to see it all the way to 100% or you know what, if it doesn't get to 50%, we're out. You know, if you watch Shark Tank, you see a lot of this, you know, these people that are not willing to negotiate. I mean, the whole point of going to Shark Tank, in my opinion, is you want that knowledge and the back group of people that Mark Cuban can bring to the table, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's got a plethora of just super smart guys. They all do, every one of those sharks, right? Now, which one fits your niche, right? Okay, so Mark doesn't want to, you're doing a sports product. He doesn't want anything to do with your sports product. What's your plan B? You know, is Barbara Corcoran going to be the answer? She's more real estate, but she has connections in this. Did you do your research? Do you know what company she's already invested in? Because if you have widget A and three of those sharks already are invested in widget A, they don't need another widget A. They want a widget C because they don't have that in their portfolio. So again, due diligence, do your, you know, your, your information. I was watching it the other night and there was a young kid on there and he just knew numbers. He rattled off numbers like crazy. And his dad said, well, it's because, you know, he, he's been told, do your research. Like you should, any small business should know their numbers, whether it's doing, um, you know, storage units or jets, you should know where you're at. You should know what your numbers are. What are your, what are your margins, you know, and where are you flexible in that? Cause on some of these deals, especially now and seeing it in the, in the aviation industry, the deals are getting smaller, right? The owners want to keep more. The agent doesn't want to pay as much. So you're stuck in how much commission you want to get or you can get. So you have to say, is that okay? Well, yeah, you know, look, hey, it's singles and doubles. It's not always home runs, you know, and, and it's the same thing in negotiation. You may go through a negotiation for four months and get to that point where it doesn't come to fruition and you go, well, hey, but I learned all these different things. Now I could, I've cut the curve, the learning curve. Instead of starting at zero, I'm starting at 80%. So when I go into this next negotiation, looking for another deal on a house or whatever you're investing in, now I'm already, you know, 80% closer to getting that deal faster than the next guy, because I've already been through these ugly paperwork issues or whatever it could be. Dude. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Like, so, and we got a couple minutes here left to finish up. Like, is there anything you haven't covered that you think might be valuable for no? Cause I mean, you're like, quite frankly, we could stop right now and you've covered a lot that people can take in, 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 implement to negotiations. And uh, I know you and I spoke uh, outside of this and this is all, all of these stories and all this stuff's going to make its way into a book someday. And I can't wait for that. Is there, is there anything we're <laughs> missing though? The that... stories, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, a I anything think, else, I think the biggest thing is not being afraid to say no and walk away from something, you know, and people get so tied up with, Oh, but if I got this deal, it would build my business to the next level. Or if I got this blank, and it's not always the case, you know, if it doesn't fit within, you know, even like the life and air model, you know what I mean? For you guys, it's, it's, does it fit into what I'm building for my future and for my family? And if it doesn't, I don't care if it's a billion dollar deal you think is going to make you happy, it'll end up destroying you because it's not the right deal. It's just, you know, and it's okay to say no, but we're so afraid to say no with anything. Oh, what if I say no and, you know, and I want to date someone and, and I want to, I say no, and then no one else comes around then I'm alone. Well, you right. know, that's part of it. But if it's not the right person, it, you may say you don't want to be alone, but do you really want to be in that? You know, and it's the same thing with business relationships and partners. You know, you, some guys comes to you and says, Hey, I got this great deal. Let's partner up. Okay, great. You don't do some due diligence. You guys start an LLC together. The next thing you know, he's drawing money against that LLC that you're unaware of. And now all of a sudden you guys have a lawsuit going, the company shut down. It could implode in so many ways because you should have said no in the first place. You knew it wasn't the right deal, but you thought, well, 
He does say he has these skills and he's got these resources. It turns out he didn't have it, but now you're stuck legally to this person. So being mindful of all those little pieces is, is important. But I'd say the biggest lesson I've learned in life is, you know, and in rock and roll, you're trained to say yes for everything. I mean, no artist wants to hear the word no. I will say I've probably said no to more artists than most people. And has it cost me gigs? Yeah, I've gotten fired off a few tours because I said, no, we're not going to do that. That's not a smart way to spend money. And then I ran into those artists years later and they're like, man, you know, I wish I would have listened to you. I have nothing left or I'm glad I listened to you, you know, even though you made me mad and I didn't like hearing no, you know, it was a healthy thing for me because it allowed me to set some boundaries. And I think that's the other important thing too, is, you know, we all need our boundaries in every part of our life. And, you know, negotiating deals is, is in my opinion, especially when you're looking at anything, you know, substantial seven, eight, nine figure deals, it's important to make sure that you're do your due diligence, but you're willing to say no, if the deal just doesn't look like something that you, that fits your business model of your life. Got it. Got it. Dude. Awesome. Awesome tips. Gold nuggets for everyone listening. I really appreciate your time, brother. And being on the show. Thank you very much. Man, Rick is a super interesting guy, dude. Um, I, I love his stories and we didn't have time. I mean, I've sat uh, at dinner with him and he's just shared story after story from the music industry and all those other things. And, and he's a, he's a great storyteller and he is a great um, example of like, just, just putting yourself out there and trying different stuff and, and learning as you go. And he, uh, yeah, I think he shared some really valuable nuggets here. Uh, and, and admittedly, I know, I know that the conversation was a little bit varied and we kind of moved all over the place a little bit. But that's just because there's just, it's just like negotiation, I think is one of those, it's kind of hard to, it's not like you can say, Hey, how do I, how do I do this? It's like, it's like almost like a conversation. So uh, I just want to recap some of the major things that I thought, you know, and took out of it. Number one, you know, he said it time and time again, like how important due diligence is like, and that will save you from even sitting down with the wrong person or wasting your time in negotiation or getting your hopes up or, or putting together a whole lot of work on the front end, unless you've already verified this is an actual person who can perform and do what they say they're going to tell you. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. The other thing that I've learned, and I don't know if you actually got better with the negotiation after this episode, Roger, because we mentioned at the beginning that this is for you. Do you feel like you we're going yeah, to have to renegotiate our contract for the life in show, Peter? <laughs> well, don't so obviously we're going to actually gonna talk about me getting paid. All right, good. Well, that's good. All right. But here's the thing. One awesome thing that I've got out of this nugget, I don't think we actually said on this episode is the fact that the way you get good in negotiate, you actually go and start talking to people, start negotiating. You know, if he talks about all the years that he's done negotiating with all kinds of different people, right? It's actually about doing it. You know, yeah, you've read yeah. books, you listen to different things by actually doing it. You start getting better. At one point he said, you know, maybe in this, you know, you were going after a billion dollar deal and you didn't happen, but guess what? In the next one, you're not starting ground zero. You'd starting at like 80%. Well, you know, and that's a really important aspect. I think for anybody, especially the people who are brand new or yeah. looking to learn and do this negotiation stuff. Well, to that point, we didn't talk about this at all, but he mentioned, you know, he's read several books. He's gone to courses, he's gone to trainings. And so what I actually, you know, we didn't even talk about this at all, but this is, that's given him a foundation to then go ahead and build upon through his own experience. And so what I really liked is, is he really seems to have applied both his own responsibility of learning and empowering himself to be a better negotiator from learning from other people, but as well as, Hey, let's put this into practice and do something with it. It's not, it's not just head knowledge. You know, um, I just today read on Facebook, one of our, uh, one of our life interest students, Laura Halverson, and I've heard her say this before as well. She said, uh, education without action is just entertainment. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, making, making something happen with what you're doing. So you're doing your own, your own work and then, doing the work by practicing it, uh, through actual negotiations and sitting down with people, you know, a couple other things that I really took out of this was, um, just being upfront, like don't misrepresent, don't, don't yes. waste someone's time and just be honest because that's what, how you'd want to be treated as well. Like just, if you're, if you're brand new to an industry and, or you've never done a deal, maybe you're a real estate investor, never done a deal. Don't, don't present your yourself to a potential seller. Like, yeah, I've, I've, you know, I'm, I'm this pro who's done all like, be honest. People can people find can that tell. stuff out. Yeah. Yeah, people can tell. That's a big one, I think, because I remember when I was way back in the day, probably early 2000s, when I was reading some of those books, some of them were talking about, you know, how you present yourself, right? Yeah. And making it look, you know, better than I think than you actually are. And the fact that he mentioned that be real, be truthful, 
I think it goes way long way for anybody. Yeah. You yeah. know, if you're just starting out, say I'm just starting out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Help me out yeah. here. Yeah. Just be honest. And uh, one of my third, my third probably favorite nugget was when he talked about like knowing, and we've all heard like know what you want going into negotiation before and knowing your numbers and your margins and knowing what you can actually do and what you can't do. But also like, I didn't really, never really thought of it this way is like, what do you, what do you look in long-term? It's not just that one negotiation. It's like, you know, is there value here that you're, that you may be sabotaging if you, uh, if you go in for the jugular here and you're trying to like rake them over the coals, well, that's going to damage your long-term relationship. So like, what are you looking for long-term as well? That was a big nugget that I got out of here too. All right. And the last big nugget, I think, don't be afraid to say no. I think that is so important, especially for people who are like quote unquote people pleasers. Yep. Right. Looking to negotiate, not just for the sake of getting the deal, but for actually how it aligns in our world with your life and their vision. Right. That's right. Does this align with your vision? Boundaries. You said afraid yeah. to say no. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Really enjoyed that. Um, you know, I look forward to his book someday. Well, and this, this podcast will hopefully, you know, push him to get this stuff into writing. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review or rating, um, subscribe, tell people about it. And, uh, the more people we reach, the, the more we are living our visions as well, because we're all here about changing lives. Uh, if you want to be part of the life in your conversation, go and download the free life in app. You can go to life to learn more about that for Android iPhone devices or your desktop. And until next time, uh, we've really enjoyed this. Hope you got value out of it too. We'll see you next week.